Did you ever stop and wonder if you could be related to everyone with your last name? Just think if you're a Lincoln, how you'd be congratulated if Honest Abe were someone you could claim. To clear up any mystery, just check your family history. Genealogy is the name of the game. Now some ancestors you'll find you want to hide. But most of them will fill your heart with pride. Oh, your family, your family tree, tree, your family tree. Check your genealogy, find who was who and how who came to be. On your family, 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 family tree. Welcome, listeners. It's time for the Genealogy Radio Show from Radio Corkabashkin the radio station that is keeping you in the loop. And this week's show is about marriage customs, burial customs and the folklore of our ancestors. We've had great interest in this from our listeners around around the world and we are most fortunate today to have Sean O'Doul on air with us. We know from previous shows that the school scheme, from which stems the school manuscripts collection and the former Irish Folklore Commission, that this programme of collecting work and documenting Irish folklore throughout Ireland is really has a, a wonderful amount of sources of film, photographs, drawings, sketches, paintings and manuscripts. We have an expert though today on this today, Sean O'Doul, who's going to talk about what they mean, you know, the marriage customs and so on, and he's no stranger to archives and folklore, and is a prolific research, you know, has has done an awful lot for the summer school down in UCC, where he's one of the main speakers, and it really has anchored the school very well. So we are going to have later shows about what's going on with Clare and folklore because Dukas are going to put that online. I'm not sure if they already have it. But I want to welcome Sean O'Doul to the show today. So welcome, Sean. Thank you very much, Lorna. It's great to be talking to you. And um, I'm going to, and I know yourself and Eileen have made such a success of the school and we're going into the third year. And you're, you, you know, people are so interested I- in what you have to say. So... Sean, how did you get started in these sources, such as marriage, folklore, burial, and so on? There was a considerable split between my mother, who was from Lowesborough County, Mayo, and my father, who was from Wexford. Their lifestyles, everything about them, and and the areas and their developments were different. And my mother's people were almost, well, they they liked Irish, and there were two of them teachers. But they were belonging to a much older world. It was at least 70 years apart from the Wexford style of things. So when, when my mother married my father, uh, there was, uh, she was teaching in Wexford and she sent in contributions. Actually, before she married him, she sent in contributions to the Folklore Commission of stories which he had told her. So clearly she was using it for ulterior purposes. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. <laughs> So you see, there was, it was a common feeling at the time that English-speaking areas, as Wexford was, would not have anything as valuable as an Irish-speaking site. So my mother, on despairing that the pupils, that, her, that the school children had no stories to tell and had no folk, had no fíniacht, had no rúriacht, and had very little in the way of folk stories to tell, so she applied to the grown-ups, oh. in particular my father. Now, the, these... My mother and her two sisters, who were close in age, they died in the 1980s, and I missed the three of them very badly. And I found out that there was stuff written by by my mother and by others, and that there was a lot of stuff from Lewisburg County Mayo in the Folklore Commission, some of which had not been disturbed since 1937. So I spent months in there going through it, and I loved it because it was uh, the writing the spelling even and the layout of the work was such as my grandparents uh, would have spoken. And I was lucky that I lived, that I spent a good part of my youth in the house where my grandparents lived. You really have no feeling for old people if you don't have grandparents around the place at some point or yes. other of your... Uh, that, uh, that's, that's very true. And those, th- a lot of those records are going up county by county now online with yes. Dukas, which is absolutely fantastic, you know. And it is. It is because until you digitize them, they were slightly chaotic. 
It took loads of time to find out where you were going. In some cases, to find out the schools and the pupils and the work done. It was very hard to find it until mm. the uh, modern uh, And, and do they have any t- uh, pupil roles in the school, or are they not in it? Ah. Well, the life of the National School at the time, I said, nobody went to any form of secondary or post-primary school. So... Uh, so the kids would go to school on a, on a bad or wet day. They would go until they were at least 14 and some 15. There was more company in the school than there was in their own house where their parents might be giving out to them. With the result that most national schools had a 7th class and some had an 8th class. There would be big solid men at the back of the room. <laughs> when the teacher would put his eyes on his book, they would commence a fit of walloping one another. <laughs> oh, but no. As soon as there was work on turnips and as soon as there was external work to be done, and especially anything that would get them a few shillings, they would be gone from school. But they'd arrive back the following November when the weather was bad. And would they get a school certificate after finishing primary school? Do uh, you know? There was a, for some of those years, there was the primary cert. <laughs> which amounted to the fact that you could, to some extent, write your name, and a little more than that. But no secondary school education until oh, the sixties. people, and it had an extraordinary effect in so far as if you had if you had good brainy fourteen year olds, they were at least the level of junior cert. I've seen a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of contributions done in particular uh, by people who were extremely good. They were they were very well advanced. They were at least fifteen year olds in in the modern sense. Okay. They did some lovely stuff. There is also an odd thing that many of them sent their their copies were sent to Dublin as well as the schoolmaster's master. Oh, we have lost Sean a minute, but we'll we'll get him back online. And um, I know that this topic is of great value because marriage customs and burial customs and so on are very important to tell us because they bring us back a generation all the time. So all the generations that we have going back that Sean is talking about, you're looking at 70 years of a, you know, 30 years of a generation and so on. So every every 70 years it'd be two generations and it's really really vital to realize that marriage customs bring you back to an old world they can bring you back to the 18th century of what's happening and burial customs even further again especially since civil registration doesn't start until 1864 in ireland and um i'm wondering do we have sean we're getting sean back i believe we have you back sean have we Yes, we have. Yes. Well, that's great indeed. Thank and you very much. Um, just to move on for the marriage customs of our ancestors, can right. you tell us about some of the marriage customs right. of our well, ancestors? Well, we'll briefly, yes. The first odd thing about it was the employment of a matchmaker, or at least the hiring, or at least you would get a matchmaker to help. In every in every civilization, there are always people who 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 are not very motivated and not very directional and who don't really know how to set about things. And the matchmaker would do all the tactical things that were needed. The next thing was that uh, marriages were usually arranged some weeks before Lent. Oh. And, and the Saturday before Ash Wednesday would be the great uh, festival for marriage. Most people would get married around then. Peg Sayers described how seven of them got married in Ballyferret around that Saturday. There would have been seven men on one side of the altar and seven women on the other side. And if you bear in mind how much money those people had to give to clergy, (laughs) you'll see why they put seven together. And there wouldn't be seven separate ceremonies, one at nine o'clock or ten o'clock, but actually all married on mass. But all seven across the... But all 14 people across the And how did they how did they manage with the do you take Sean to be your lawfully wedded husband? One after another. One after another. Okay. Over long, yes, yes. Now, the other feature of most weddings was a horse race. A horse race um, would, was, was a valuable feature of most weddings, I'd say, until around 1920. It was called the drag race, the drag and the horse race, and it was always a part of it. There would have been a competition for men and a competition for, fam- for husbands and wives, and there would be whiskey for the winner, and uh, people contested it very strongly. That would have been a feature of most weddings. The next thing was the the actual feasting or the food would be far better than usual. I don't think people remember now what feasting is because they seem to think that it's gourmet foods. 
In most of those times, the people had to ration exactly how much they would eat. They would often leave the table less than less than entirely satisfied. So if you could eat, if you could eat to feeling full, it was a great day. So feasting would have been a part of it. Then there was a visit of the straw boys who would have turned up in a lot of the country, in the Wexford side, in the Mayo side, up towards Armagh, and that side anywhere there were mummers, the straw boys would appear, dance, drag some of the older people out on the floor, and generally make merriment for about half an hour to an hour, and be paid with a certain quantity of whiskey. Right? Oh, very interesting. So a lot of fun. and, and Yeah, um... they would, yeah, they would. There would be some poor woman, God bless her, who hadn't got on a dance floor for 60 years, and probably was very was uh, was not the easiest mover in the world and some who liked to drag her out whether she liked it or not and oh. it would be a lot of fun uh, the next thing was that the dowry half the dowry would be usually paid or was said to be paid before the wedding and there was one half then to be paid on the on the birth of the first child oh so it wasn't paid until the birth of the first child and that's what that is what they generally say that the second half was due when the child was born now I I didn't find any information as to what happened if there was at this particular time no money you probably just had to write it off <laughs> that was that Okay. Right. Now, I have come across dowries in the 16th century and 17th century where the eldest girl got a big dowry oh, and the as the gir- get- yeah as the girls went down the the dowry became less Is that so? Yes. That's so, the yeah. dowry became a lot less. The dowry, the dowry, as far as Lowesburg was concerned, I think in the twenties and thirties, they said at the time that a milk milk cow was uh, was worth, was going for about a tenner. This would have been the hungry thirties. The price of four or five cows was considerable was considered a more than adequate dowry. It wasn't bad at all for poor people. That is a very big. So dowry. it was sixty or seventy pounds was a fine dowry and you gave the girl you gave her a five pound note and you said no go and buy whatever you want for that yes so um, fascinating it, like uh, quite a lot of pressure on people though to provide the dowry and, oh God, and the late in ireland as well going right yes. up to made matches and so on you know so well the modern form of the dowry is you try to find out how your girlfriend lives. Does she have a way of living? <laughs> this would become part of your lifestyle. Yes. As as the guards did, let's say, 40, 50 years ago, when they made sure to marry the national teachers. Yes. On the very, yeah, the dowry was the actual work that the girl would be able to do in her qualifications. And there is still a fair, a certain amount of that round. Yes, there is, there is. There is, yes. And, that was and what's the most unusual marriage custom you've come across, Sean? Or well, have one you come of them, which I know, an old man and his wife told me, was that when a girl would be leaving her family home to go to the new home, they would uh, they would throw a sod at her flight and a sod at her after her as a symbol that she'd bring the light with her. But the other thing is they would throw the tongs as well after it. And they liked it if the tongs fell, as they said, open on the ground. <laughs> So it was a good sign of a marriage. Oh, that's wonderful. There was another one then as well that um, in some places they used to bake not the modern wedding cake, but they'd bake a big brown cake. And they used to, in I presume in a jocose way, they used to break it on the bride's head. Now, it's a lot less dangerous than it sounds because there would be it would be inscribed with a cross and it would fairly easily fall into four parts. I mean, yes. it wasn't designed to insult her or break Hopefully her head. Hopefully it wouldn't be the mother-in-law b- breaking it across her head no, no, or no, anything that's like that. No, the cake on the bride's head. There are oh. little things there in that. Oh, that's wonderful. And some of the burial customs, Sean? When, uh, 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 the burial customs? Where are you? Yes. The first thing would be stop to stop the clock when the person dies. Okay. Stop, st- just stop the clock. You just stopped say, the clock. I, that saved the problem of, of what time did she die or what time did he die. Now, to stop the clock, the next thing is open the windows so the soul can get out. Okay. Next thing is, well, you were supposed to have a ha- If you had an old person in the house, you'd have a habit and you'd have candles and you'd have four pieces of black cloth cross-shaped and you'd have the candlewick bedspread and all that. You'd have things ready for the big day. The, as a person is dying, it's right to say prayers in their ears and recite the act of contrition, etc., etc. And you shake holy water around the room, and you keep shaking it for two or three hours. Okay. <laughs> the devil watches to take your relative. Okay. Right. 
Now, when the person uh, in, certainly in Lewisburg and in many other areas, they didn't like an old person or indeed anyone to die in a bed because the bed had to be thrown away afterwards. That's right. Unbelievably, That's right. they used to take them out of bed and put them on a few pieces of straw on the floor. That's correct. And the bed had were, to be burnt otherwise, yeah, you see. Yeah, yeah. And if you knew that there you are, 80 years of age in a bad way, trembling with... That's yeah, right. Trembling in misery. You'll find your son and his wife and the two of them hop you out on the floor. They hop you out, yes, they you do, know because you have to burn the bed. That's it. That, that is in my own. The bed, yeah. That is in my own traditional uh, family in, in Connemara. That's what you did. You yes. just did not keep the bed, and that was it. Oh, so you definitely. Yeah. And the itinerants keep the same custom going when a person dies, they burn the caravan. Yes, they do. They are. They're rather wonderful that way. Yes. Yeah, so now the you call uh, the various women then who understand such things come to help the people of the house. Uh, in the old days, there would be caning women. Oh, they yes. would put up a whale, but they would also do useful things like they would wash the body. They would prefer prepare the body for uh, the weight. Yes, they would. And when they washed the body, one of the women had started the head, and one of them had started the feet. And so Obviously, they'd meet somewhere on the line. And they would keep the water that had washed the person. It was a cure for migraine. Oh. Yeah, what's the, what the water that washes the dead is a cure for migraine. Now, they had other little customs like taking the long way to the graveyard. Uh, that happened for my, my own father, Beryl. Uh, one of the relatives just said he used to love so going up such and such a road. And I, he knew him that part of his life better than I did. So he was brought that way to the graveyard. So, uh, and it could be a different torturous route as well. You know, yes, they would yeah, they yeah. would want to respect the last wishes. Oh, of which the was people. yeah, it was considered vulgar to take a shortcut. <laughs> it was considered very vulgar to yeah, take a shortcut. It was. It was. It was it, it, these would these things. These things were very important because they marked the death. They made it familiar to you that you understood a little bit about it, and they took away many of the terrors of it. Yes. They would draw the relatives together, or occasionally they would draw the relatives apart, depending on the nature of the relatives, whether they wanted to commune together or whether they wanted to get into dispute. That's right. There would be kind of what nowadays what they call reminiscence therapy, going back through thinking of former times and relatives. Or arbitration, as it was legally known, really, with the, with the Gaelic laws. I've come across a lot of arbitration. Yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which which uh, which deals with this as well, and also uh, the uh, what, there are many examples of ceremony. For the for example, the Jews have a ceremony of sitting shiva. That is, they get food and drink, and they spend all night talking about the dead. And that was the same here for at least one night. And had you to stay awake all night? Could you go to sleep, Sean? Well, there would be a few beds for kids who would go to bed. But I can remember when my grandfather died. Some about ten or eleven older men sipped away on whiskey and the upper in the room of bow, as we called it. And uh, geez, I was around eleven or twelve if I had been able to hear it, because my grandfather was full of mischief, and it would have been a wonderful piece of work. Yeah. They would, they, behind the sadness, there would be lots of laughter, and which is a healthy way of going at it, you know. Yeah, there so, is there uh, is a lot of uh, like um, I didn't really take cognizance of how special um, Irish funerals are until I I suppose I had people home that weren't we used to Irish funerals and yeah, then you yeah. realise the importance of they of were very very useful and also they were in some cases uh, in the cases of children or young women uh, there would not be games and that kind of thing. But in the case of older people, there used to be considerable wealth of games and sport and teenage games and all this kind of thing. Yes. And uh, there were, Sean O'Sullivan of the Folklore Commission uh, has a list of 247 games in one of his books. And he says himself that he doesn't want to give a description of most of them because they were, he thinks, obscene. Okay. Uh, any society will, to some extent, teach uh, love making and things like that, or at least give an overall <laughs> understanding of it to the young crowd. And and uh, I'm sorry to say, but funerals was the occasion for some of this. Oh, so uh, not all doom and gloom then for funerals. As as oh, we... that is an important point. Is that the Irish funeral was the common funeral across Northern Europe? Well, let's say in the case of an older person, you cannot be surprised if someone of the age of 80 or 90 or 100 years of age dies, you know. 
And when you have done a certain amount of gr- of grief, you cannot stick in that in that emotional position forever. And people used to do their grieving, and then they used to get on with a fair good bit of fun. And uh, if the man of the house wasn't strong and determined, the games would start and the half set or set would be going. I'm not saying now that they'd have a load of musicians in or anything, but there would be a lot of entertainment. Well, I would priests not be there to object to that? Or? The priests... Uh, Oh, I'd no, I'd no doubt if they were there, they would object. But there's no priest going to go to spend half the night there. Exactly. So what you have to do, you have to do is wait for them to go. Exactly. And that's encourage them by asking them questions. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, well, yes. Sean, that's absolutely fascinating, you know, to know that the wealth of this material gives these marriage and, and burial customs and that folklore is yes. so important. And on a serious oh, note, how important is it for the folklore records to be recognised? Well, the short answer is it would be an awful pity to waste them because there was a lot of work in taking them and it was the biggest project of its kind across a lot. I think only up in Sweden and Norway have they more stuff. Oh. And possibly over in the Romanian places. But England is terribly short on that particular type of folklore. The last person who wrote any of it was Thomas Hardy in English in his novels. There is that kind of a sense yes. there. France doesn't appear. Countries that have a very formal, let's say, that have a formal academy type of music, most of them have lost their, their folklore music, their folk music and all that. And Ireland is a beacon of light. Things like the Willie Clancy and yes. these are full of skill and learning which is important if you want to try to recreate the music of the past exactly but it's the same for other aspects exactly it's why we're bringing in a night of you know set dancing into the summer school well, and things like, yeah. like that this year because it's one of the queries that came that, that they liked your talk so much on the marriage and the burial and, and so on that I they know, wanted I'm, to hear more of that they wanted more of the cultural themes I'm always I'm always a bit suspicious of flattery Lorna oh well you're very you, you know I'm, not I'm at not all not that good now you're there very are good. lots of people of my age who know this stuff there are lots of people who do, but they wouldn't be able to impart it in I the I remember the later the way you do. In, uh, in Quilty and people like that that had a passion to pass on their understanding of the world in case it would be lost. And there are other people like that. And there are lots of people. Yes. Yeah, well, I suppose I'd be interested in the superstitions as well. Being very superstitious myself, from inherited from my grandmother, I, pr- I presume that there's a wealth of superstitions that, that can there be is, There is, there is. And the abound. difficulty... Difficulty with them is that some have quite a strong grain of common sense in them. <laughs> some are visibly and obviously daft. <laughs> yes, and yes. The difficulty is sorting them. Some yeah, them which are one? Which ones are the valid ones, and which yes, ones are yeah, not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you that know. Is, yeah. And have you any of the superstitions? We're nearly oh, finished God, the show, there so. Ah, uh, there was lots. Ah, uh, Lord, there's lots of superstition. For example, I was one time in the grounds of St. James's Hospital in James Street in Dublin here. And I was after saying good night to a nurse. It was about half one in the morning or something. And in the car, and then I headed to get out of the place. And geez, it's, it's such an extensive hospital. I drove around for about two hours and couldn't find the gate anywhere. So at that point, I took off my jacket and I turned it inside out and put it on, lining to the outside. And this is the first little drive I took. I got straight out the gate. Why well, is that supposed to get you out of misfortune? Oh, that's it? how. When you're lost and don't know where you are, that's how you get out of it. Oh my God! Turn the what, jacket or whatever oh, it is inside out of the way. I've just, I've just inherited a new superstition, and I'll definitely <laughs> have you back on the show to talk entirely about superstitions. It is yeah. a wonderful genealogical theme. Yeah. Sean, thank you very, Can very much for today because we're, we've come to the end of our time. But I really right, appreciate right. you, and sorry for the bad weather interrupting uh, us and there. I'm sorry for the break here. No, no, that was the bad weather. That's we've well, got terrible okay. weather down okay. here. So, uh, yeah, uh, we're snow, snow is falling here but it's not going to last yes well we, we're, we've just got a bit of wind and bits and pieces but we're in Kilkee which is a beautiful spot yes. in County Clare and Indeed thank you thank you Sean for your time today You're I really appreciate welcome. it thank, thank you good luck Lorna thank and you see you soon yeah, bye 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 now, we're going to put up a link for Sean and Eileen's DVD and you can contact me, Lorna Maloney, in relation to same as we have a number of them for sale. They're wonderful sources. And not to forget that both Sean and Eileen are core summer school lecturers for ancestral connections and also 
Eileen Wolf is a lead genealogist at Romana 800, where we have 45 consultations left for July the 5th. So if any of you are interested in those online, they can be booked um, and just contact me at lorna at dramana800.com and we'll put uh, links to that in the show and to conclude all the shows are now podcasts so you can gain access at the Radio Cork Abashkin website or through Mixed Cloud and thank you for listening tell your friends and relatives about the genealogy radio show keeping you in the loop and it's also the show is also repeated on a Sunday at half two. So thank you very much indeed. Slán Gafol and talk to you next week at the same time. Did you ever stop and wonder if you could be related to everyone with your last name? Just think if you're a Lincoln, how you'd be congratulated if honest Abe were someone you could claim. To clear up any mystery, just check your family history. Genealogy's the name of the game. Now some ancestors you'll find you want to hide. But most of them will fill your heart with pride. Oh, your family, your family tree, tree, your family tree. Check your genealogy, genealogy find who was who and how who came to be. Your family, 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 family dreams.